there's a new James Bond film out at the beginning of April. We did, so to celebrate we thought, what the hell? Let's get together the six greatest Bond cars of all time, one per Bond actor, and drive them all back to back. And what a lineup we have for you, because representing Team Sean Connery, we have the Aston Martin DB5. We have George Lazenby's DBS. This is an age order, of course. How beautiful is that? Roger Moore's Lotus Esprit S1. Timothy Dalton's V8 Vantage, Pierce Brosnan's BMW Z8, and last but not least, Daniel Craig's DB10. And because some of you whippersnappers might not remember all the old stuff so well, we'll start here with the newest, the rarest, and the most expensive car we have here. Yes, only 10 DB10s were ever built for the 2015 film Spectre, and only one was ever sold to the public. This one, for just under £2.5 million. Pounds. Best behaviour then. But what makes this car really special isn't the price or the rarity or even the fact that Daniel Craig's butt cheeks have been on this very chair. No, it's the fact that this is the only Bond car to be designed from scratch to feature in a Bond film and not go into production. Basically, the director, Sam Mendes of Spectre, met up with Marek Reitman, the design director, Aston Martin, and told him he wanted a new Bond poster car for a new generation of boys and girls that might be watching Bond for the first time. Marek Reitman read that as he wanted a modern incarnation of the DB5, so something pure, simple, instantly attractive. And this is the result and it looks absolutely sensational. But there's nothing prototype about the way it drives. That's because under this carbon fibre bodywork is a modified platform from the old V8 Vantage. It's got a wider track, longer wheelbase, a six-speed manual and the old 4.7-litre V8 producing around 500 horsepower. This is the naturally aspirated V8, of course, before Aston started using Merck's twin-turbo 4-litre, which is why it sounds, well, like this. This wouldn't be a Bond car without some gadgets, and the DB10 is fully loaded. It gets an ejector seat, just like the DB5, a two-stage process. The first is a button that blows off the roof, and the second is a little flip switch on the top of the gear lever that ejects the driver and seat up into the air and parachutes them down to safety somewhere away from the danger. Now, this car doesn't actually have that flip switch on the gear lever, but it does have one of these which is a hydraulic handbrake for flamboyant driving seats. But perhaps the most memorable gadget on the DB10 is a machine gun that sticks out of the badge at the back. You might remember Inspector that Daniel Craig doesn't have any ammo when he wants to use it, so he has to resort to flamethrowers from the exhaust pipe, which, you know, do the trick and actually this car here has the machine gun toy attached. <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> We've got machine guns! As if it needs any introduction, this is the BMW Z8. Designed by Henrik Fisker, yep, the bloke behind the Fisker Karma and more recently the Tesla chasing Fisker Ocean EV, it's a homage to the BMW 507 from the 50s. Weirdly, for a car that was retro when it was launched 20 years ago, it doesn't look terrible. It's aged brilliantly, in fact. Bond and Aston were on a break when this appeared in the 1999 film The World Is Not Enough, and it's not bad, is it, for a rebound relationship? Z8 can go for as much as 200 grand these days, but you can see why, because it's still such a sweet car to drive, especially that engine, five litre V8, naturally aspirated, 400 horsepower. It's the engine from the E39 M5, so you've got loads of torque and it sounds absolutely fantastic. 
Now this car has a bit of a reputation for being tricky, should we say, on the limit, a little bit snatchy, a product perhaps of a lack of development. But when you drive it at eight tenths, oh, it's just an utter joy. As are these overtly retro touches on the interior, like this 12 spoke steering wheel and the fact that the instrument dials are in the middle of the dash. Not great for, you know, actually reading them, but looks damn cool. And check this out back here. There are car phones and then there's this. Look at that. Hello. Yeah, can I speak to Money Penny? Cheers. Famously, the Z8 met its end when it was chopped in half by a circular saw dangling from a helicopter. But before all that mess happened, it had a chance to show off some of its tricks, which included a remote control mode, so Bond could summon it using the key fob. Not as cool as the 750IL, which he drove using the screen on his phone, but, you know, not bad. The main selling point of the Z8, though, was surface-to-air missiles, which came out of the front flanks here and shot down a helicopter. And you could aim those missiles with a control pad in the center of the wheel. Unfortunately, this is a production car and it wasn't on the options list, so yeah, it's just a haul. And we continue our journey back in time with this, the Aston Martin V8 Vantage, a brute of a car driven by Timothy Dalton in the 1987 film, The Living Daylights. Now, in its day, this was known as Britain's first supercar because of its 170 mile an hour top speed. And towards the end of its life, it received 440 horsepower from its 5.3 litre V8. Now this is a slightly earlier car, so it's got around 400 horsepower, but you get the idea. This is not a car for the faint hearted. It's got a dog leg, five speed manual gearbox down here. The steering is actually quite light, but it feels big. It feels heavy, it feels manly. Grrr. The good news is we're gonna see more of this car in the new film. Although how big a role it plays, we just don't know. What we do know is when this car first appears in the living daylights, it's a convertible. But after being sent to Q Branch for a fettle, it reappears with a fixed roof, like this one. All part of being winterized, says Q. And it's that winterization process that brought us some of the greatest bond bits we've ever seen, including skis that emerge from the side of the car and spike tires to give you some grip in wintry conditions. And there's also a rocket booster hidden behind the rear number plate to give you that burst of speed when you really need it. And let's not forget, this is a car that already has missiles in the front bumper and freaking laser beams that come out the wheel hubs to chop in half any baddies that are foolish enough to pull alongside. But more than anything, it just looks cool, this car, doesn't it? I think I want one. Hit it! That's what I'm talking about! Wait! Okay now, from the beginning. Firstly, apologies that I'm not presenting this part of the video from underwater, but uh, unfortunately our budget wouldn't stretch to a wetsuit. So here, back on dry land, I'm driving what must be the best known non-Aston Martin Bond car of them all, the mighty Lotus Esprit. I refer, of course, to the fact that the 1977 film The Spy Who Loved Me featured an Esprit affectionately known as Wet Nelly, with a submersible mode, wheel arches for fins, and a periscope on the roof so Roger Moore could see where he was going. And the tricks didn't end there. On the road, it had a cement sprayer behind the rear number plate, perfect for laying a new driveway in a hurry. While underwater, it had missiles, mines, and torpedoes, and could do an excellent impression of a distressed octopus by dispersing a thick black dye into the water. Back in the real world, this car is everything that Lotus stood for and still kind of stands for. Back there is a teeny tiny two litre, four cylinder engine producing just 160 horsepower, which isn't very much, is it? But when the car weighs less than a thousand kilos, well, it's plenty. Famously, Cubby Broccoli had to draft in Roger Becker, who was Lotus's chassis engineer, to get this car to throw some shapes in one of the chase scenes because his stunt driver claimed it just grips too hard. I can't make it look dramatic, Cubby, and do you know what? 
I know what he means. It might be an absolute featherweight in this car, but the way it sticks to the road is just incredible. It feels smooth, sophisticated, well engineered, and that engine sounds a whole lot better than I thought it would, but it feels so, so special. And what about this interior? Probably the greatest car interior of all time. You sit on what feels like a sort of deck chair position and the trim in here is amazing. Green and orange tartan. You've got this instrument panel that just wraps around you with the greatest switch of them all. Pop-up headlights. <laughs> I'm just so grateful I've eventually got to drive this car. I feel so privileged to be allowed to have a go in this. And if I'm honest, I'm quite grateful it hasn't broken down. Let's face it, if there was a whipping boy for this group, this would be it, the DBS. It's got a straight six to the Vantage's V8 and it only appeared in one film alongside the Bond who only appeared in one film. George Lazenby in On Her Majesty's Secret Service. And get this, it's got no gadgets. I'll repeat that, it's got no gadgets apart from, I suppose, a case for a sniper rifle in the glove box, but frankly, that's a bit pathetic. And it gets worse. In one scene, it's shown covered in flowers for Bond's wedding to Tracy. And in the final scene of the film, Tracy is shot dead while sitting in the car, proving it doesn't even have bulletproof glass. Outrageous, right? However, though its Bond credentials are weak, this is still a beautiful car. It was on sale in the late 60s. It crossed over a bit with the DB6, but this heralded a new, more modern era for Aston Martin design with its squared off front end. And it's such a memorable driving experience. Four litre, inline six, 300 horsepower, sounds fantastic. Of course, it feels so, so special. This car here has been fully restored, so feels tight as a drum. So as I said, it's a special car. It's just not a proper bond car. Unlike this, this is the car that pops into your head when you hear the word Bond. A car that first starred alongside Sean Connery in the 1964 film Goldfinger and has appeared in seven other Bond films since, including the new one, No Time to Die. Icon is a word banded around quite a lot these days, mostly by me in this video to be fair, but this car is just that, isn't it? It's a pop icon, it's an automotive icon, it's a movie icon, it's arguably more famous than any of the men that have played Bond. And like Bond, it's quintessentially British. Sporty, but not showing off. It's luxurious, but not vulgar. It's like a vintage watch, handcrafted in its... Do you know what, I'm just gonna shut up and go for a drive. And we begin with the gadgets, because the DB5 is where it all started. In fact, to begin with, this car only ever had a smoke screen, but as members of the crew on Goldfinger kept coming up with increasingly good ideas, well, they kept adding them to the car. So you got the bulletproof screen at the back, you got the machine guns that came out the front indicators, the spikes that came out the wheels, the oil sprayer out the back, and of course, the ejector seat, which featured both in Skyfall and Goldfinger originally. And you know what? It's important, this stuff, because these are the kind of things that kids dream up. And the DB5 made them real. So, a four litre straight six, 282 horsepower, five speed manual. It feels lively, sporty even, but sporty from an era when smoking 20 lucky strike was considered beneficial to your tennis game. It's not the fragile classic you might think, but in GoldenEye it has an evenly matched Ding Dong with a Ferrari 355. Let's just say artistic license was used liberally in that scene. More than anything though, there's a sense with this car that if I crash it, it's a perfectly original example worth over half a million quid, my life wouldn't be worth living. So I'm taking it easy today. I'm in chill out mode. What the f is that? This is Mark Higgins, rally driver turned stunt driver and the man tasked with making Bond look like a driving god on the big screen. But I've got a feeling that DB5 isn't entirely stacked.
Fruity entrance, <laughs> you made there. I think I might have to put my belt on. It's probably a good idea, one. actually. I think so. Probably a sensible idea. Now, this is an actual stunt car from No Time to Die. Is that right? Yeah, this is one of the very ones we used. Um, there yeah. was a few in a few of them. Uh, real nice little toy, to be honest. It does everything it uh, should do. Um, yeah. It was great fun to drive on the film. So I've heard. So this is. <coughs> it looks perfect. It looks like an actual. DB5. We keep mistaking it with the original one we got over there, but this is a replica carbon fibre body yep. plonked on top of a donor car. Can you tell us about what's underneath it? No idea what that could be, to be honest. Yeah, I don't know. Do you know what? It's lucky you're good at driving because you're a rubbish <laughs> It sounds, I don't know, six cylinder German rear wheel drive to me, but you know, who am I to say? Either way, it's an amazing piece of kit. It's great, and one of the great things about the car is it's so much lighter as well. Yeah. And that makes a big difference on how you can actually drive it. So here you can throw some shapes in this thing. Well, you try. <laughs> That's it then, I've driven them all, bucket list ticked. But the question remains, which one would I take home? It's got to be the DB5, hasn't it? It's got to be the DB5, except I'm a little bit in love with this Lotus right here. Honestly, it's the most surprising car I've driven in a long, long time. How can something as wedgy as that still be comfortable and refined? It's witchcraft, honestly. Actually, do you know what, sod it, I'm gonna have them both. I'm a cop out. What can I say? Now there is one more car I want to show you. It's over there and unfortunately it's the one I'm not allowed to drive. The Aston Martin Valhalla. If you need a reminder that's Aston Martin's roughly thousand horsepower million quid V6 hybrid hypercar. It's the son of Valkyrie and it should be on sale around 2022 now that Aston Martin has secured some funding. This car here is a movie hack so it's a Valhalla body placed on top of an undisclosed donor car. The truth is we don't even know how big a role this is going to play in the new film No Time to Die. We don't even know if James Bond actually drives it. But I tell you what, if this is the future of Bond cars, then the bloodline's in pretty safe hands. <laughs> <laughs> 